that. Now for the last time this evening, meet the author. Who said way? Was that because it was the last time this evening? <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, just, uh, I don't think it, uh, there's much left to the imagination after tonight. We have had a celebration of John McLaughlin, a celebration of the ability for somebody to draw together musical talent that is extensive, that all lives within 10 miles of this very building, um, through a commitment not just to the music, but to him as an individual, somebody we respect and love, who has supported us over the years and uh, is a very, very special person, which is why we've all uh, thrown our heart and soul into this very special occasion. Also to celebrate this incredible building, which will be spawning careers, putting them on video, on audio, uh, digitally enhancing and representing uh, the creative spark that is happening in Belfast and has happened since the, since I guess since the troubles came to an end and people have managed on a so much easier basis to work together, rehearse together, write together and be creative. So it is a great reason to celebrate and to look at the body of work uh, that has been generated by one man to produce such an incredible quarter of a million word book and, and more an ebook to celebrate the specific period and specific and detailed research of Colin Harbour. So this is your last chance. We would like some volunteers from the floor to ask some questions. Would anybody like to be brave before I point at you? Have you started the sequel? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Thank you, Excitable Dave. Actually, um, that's uh, Dave Mullen, who's um, uh, working on the website for, for this book. This is being recorded, uh, this, this podcast is being recorded in November 2013. And I sincerely hope by January 2014, um, the website will be... <laughs> no, uh, no pressure, Dave. No, um, the... <laughs> the, I mean, what, what Lenny said there, I, I, I mean, it's very humbling and it's very flattering, and uh, all I can say is I, I actually can't... Uh, I mean, if, you, if you're listening to that music, and uh, it's absolutely mind-blowing, uh, the, the performance level of the people involved, all of them, Ali, Scott, Sean, Lindley, Pat, and everybody who's played before, and, um, you know, I know there's people who have a feel for my bank balance, and they kind of think, how, how can he be affording that? And actually, the truth is, I can't. I, you know, because there's virtually no money involved in this, so all these incredible guys, world-class talents, world-class talents, like Lindley Hamilton and Pat Gribben and so on, uh, Tina McSherry, Ronnie Greer, uh, Triona, everybody uh, is um, really incredibly generous with their time, and uh, John McLaughlin was very generous in, in saying, you know, you go ahead, Colin. Um, and I, I, you know, I... It's one of those ones, I'm not actually sure whether I should send him a book because, you know, he, he, he was so polite but firmly disinterested that, I, I, you know, if he gets a book in the post, will he go, oh, for God's sake, you know? Or will he, or will he think, oh, that's nice. Um, no, where was I with that chord? You know. Um, but anyway, these are all interesting questions, but I think the big question has yet to be asked. The big question has yet to be asked, which is, how on earth did somebody get that as hand luggage on a plane in 1973? What, what has happened to our airlines? But I also have to thank um, not, not, only, uh, not only John and yourselves, um, not only Cormac. I mean, Cormac, okay, and, and Donal and Ona and everybody who's involved in this, you know, not only could I not afford you, Lindley, but I couldn't afford them. And I think this is maybe the point that they're thinking, hang on a minute, has he? <laughs> <laughs> no, Cormac is an incredibly generous man, and I hope this podcast is, uh, you know, I, I hope this is a shop window for what Cormac and Redbox Studios are, are going to do as much as for me and for you and for all these great musicians. And um, I, I, I ought to thank Heather as well, uh, my wife Heather, who's, who's down there. Yeah, I feel like David, David Dimble will be here. Yes, you, you with the glasses over there. You've, um, Heather has, you know, Heather would quite often over the, over the last couple of years, you know, would come into the room in which I'm typing, 
you know, the billionth word and, and be listening to, you know, John McLaughlin live recordings of independent origin from a hundred years ago and say, what fresh hell is this? <laughs> and, you know, and, I mean, let's be frank, Lindley, the material you've just played, it's not going to be gracing any hit parades soon, is it? But, and yet there was a time when that, 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 was, that was that close to the mainstream, which is an incredible thing to think of, actually. Incredible to think of that. But, no, Heather's been hugely supportive of this. And, uh, you know, I, I was in quite a bad place three or four years ago, and I was wasting my time in a, in a stupid job. It was just no good. And, and after a while, you realise I should be writing, but I should be doing something that I can do. I should be contributing something to the world. I should be doing something that I'm good at. I should be doing something that will actually sit on a shelf for 50 years, you know, even if it ends up being a shelf in a, a faux retro bar in Leitrim. At least it exists. So I'm really pleased to have done this book and to answer Dave's question um, in a very roundabout way, I'm working on a sequel in the sense that I'm writing a book about the history of Irish uh, piping, Ilian piping, uh, specifically focused on John McSherry, Tina's brother. So at the moment I'm up to about 1740, which... I think, I think is uh, I think is one of John McLaughlin's favourite time signatures. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think you're right. <laughs> Do we have any more questions from the floor? Kyle Leach. Oh. What's that? It's actually highly intelligent, as far as I know. Yeah. <laughs> I've actually no idea because I haven't seen it. I I I really don't know. I I, I um. <laughs> You know, I, I was involved in the graphic design uh, with a friend called Mark Case, um, who's done the, the cover of the book and the photo section and so on. I was involved in the graphic design. I must say, when I was looking at the cover, you know, the cover looks great and the back cover and the spine and thinking, I'm thinking, how does he know how thick the spine's going to be? At some point, is Mark going to get a call from the publisher saying, see that spine? Uh, put another three inches on it. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I really don't know. Um, all I, uh, the funny thing is, Mark Lewison, who's uh, just this month published a colossal first volume of his three-volume Beatles biography, Tune In, uh, which goes up to 1962, which is you know, before their first hit, really. It's, it's 400,000 words, you know? And he, he was contracted for 250,000 words, so... He, um, you know, he obviously uh, had an interesting chat with his publisher at some point. Um, but the the interesting thing about Lewison is that he, um, you know, and I, I applaud that amount of work going into something, and I understand completely the the motivation of people who want to do that amount of work to get it right, because uh, this is the last chance saloon. You know, like I said, you know, the people who, you know, the people who made music in the fifties and sixties are now in their seventies. So let's let's do it. Let's get it right. Um, and. You know, his, he does have a 780,000 word version of that first book, which is going to be available next, uh, I think in January, as a deluxe edition for about 100 quid. So I know you'll be first in the queue for that, uh, for that book. Um, actually, just, on a, uh, <laughs> just to deviate very slightly away from whatever the question was about 100 years ago, um, the, the, the research for this book uh, involved a couple of trips to uh, the British Library, uh, you know, because there's only so many, you know, ancient magazines and, and, you know, books that you can buy off eBay before your money runs out. And the trip to the British Library will at least get you complete collections of melody makers and so on for the, for the era concerned. And, you know, you go through them and you, you know, line by line and you find tantalising little references and you form chronologies and, you know, uh, then, then you go back and interview people around those chronologies and, uh, you know, quite often you're telling them things they'd forgotten. But... Uh, where was I going with that? Uh, oh yes, uh, yeah, most of my research was um, was done. Well, most of my interviews were done on the phone, and uh, I should say here thank you um, specifically to whoever it was at Tesco who invented the Tesco phone card, um, because the, honestly, the amount of the amount of phone call, the amount of two-hour phone calls at uh, strange times of the day to America that were involved. You know, with a recording device attached to the phone. Vir you know, virtually the whole book was researched and written. From, from my living room with a, with a Tesco phone card. Um, and almost the only trip out I made was to Dave Kane's cycle shop in Ballyhackamore. Because the man, now at this point I'm gonna leave the microphone and go down to the bag of goodies, bear with me. The 
The man who was John McLaughlin's first band leader was Big Pete Duker. <laughs> and Big Pete Duker and his professors of ragtime um, were somewhere, were towards the top of the third division in the trad jazz boom in the late 50s. And uh, John left home at 16 and joined Big Pete's band and uh, they rode the trad jazz boom. And whenever that ran out of steam, Big Pete reinvented himself as an R&B guy and somehow got a six month residency at the Marquee. And he appeared on Five O'Clock Club with uh, Alexis Corner. And then when, when that thing ran its course, he made a folk record in the late 60s. And, and then when the music business kind of, kind of finally worked out that Big Pete, well, perhaps he wasn't in the top echelon, he became a professional cyclist and he went around the world in 1971. So when John McLaughlin was playing Carnegie Hall for the first time, Christmas 1971, Big Pete uh, was in Australia, was in a bar in Australia, arguing with a barman about the etiquette of closing time. And apparently, <laughs> this is a book I got, he wrote, the, this, this book is about his round the world trip, and um, it you know, costs 30 quid off eBay, but you know, if things exist, you have to get them. If you know that, if you know that primary and secondary sources exist, you know, up, up to a point, you have to get them. Although I should say that Mark Lewison's budget is probably a great deal more than mine. But uh, so poor old Big Pete was, was, was crashing around the world like the last of the, um, the, last of the, uh, the colonial retired colonels, you know, arguing with, you know, arguing with chickens and turkey and, 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 and packies and, and, and wherever it is packies come from. And I'm, I'm quoting Big Pete here, actually. I'm not, I'm not saying that, honestly. <laughs> I'm quoting Big Pete. So, you know, he, he, there's a lot of un-PC stuff in this book, but he's a fascinating guy and he ended up um, going around the world and... Um, uh, he became, you know, he became a big, a big noise in the uh, in the British cycling world. And because there's very little, because there's very little um, documentary evidence, primary sources on Big Pete Duker and the professors of ragtime, um, I, I clawed in as much as I could for a bonus chapter in the ebook. Um, and after a while, I thought, you know what? Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe Dave at the cycle shop, maybe. Maybe he knows something about this. So I went down to see Dave and at a cycle shop, and uh, sure enough, Dave did know Big Pete. He said, "Oh, that was the guy with the guitar, wasn't it?" You know, uh, at all those cycling events in the in the seventies and eighties, Big Pete would be there with his guitar at the end of the night and so on. So, um, so yeah, pretty much my only physical research trip was half a mile up the road to Ballyhackamore <laughs> to Dave's to Dave's cycle shop, <laughs> and everything else was done by. Uh, it's done by phone telephone. Card. Tesco phone card. Tesco phone card. Thank you, Tesco. We're just going to have one more question from the floor, and that's Kyle Leach. It was just asked all about Ginger Baker uh, firing John McLaughlin. Oh, yes. Um, did you have the uh, nerve to interview Ginger? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> I did, however, I did, however, purchase, uh, purchase a copy of Ginger's autobiography for 99 pence from, uh, from Amazon Marketplace. <laughs> So it's, you know, it, 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 it gnaws at my very soul that Ginger Baker has a 7% royalty from 99 pence of my money. Um, you know, possibly the most obnoxious man in music. Um, but by, by, <laughs> by his own admission, you know? you know? Actually, the funny thing, I did quote from my friend uh, Valerie Wilmer, who's a terrific, um, really terrific photographer who was very active in the jazz and blues world in, in London in the 60s. Uh, the book is actually dedicated to Valerie and also to Ian, the late Ian MacDonald, um, who interviewed John a lot of times and who wrote a, a famous book on the Beatles called Revolution in the Head, the Beatles music in the 60s. And, uh, you know, Val wrote a, a feature on, on uh, Ginger Baker, uh, and I think I'm right in saying it was her feature in the, in the early 70s that was headlined, I know I'm a monster, says Ginger Baker. <laughs> Um, I may be getting that wrong. That might have been a Chris Welsh feature, but but even even then, I don't think I don't think Ginger was making too many friends in the music world. But uh, but no, I, the thing about dedicating books to people, Valerie and the lady in McDonald, I think it's important to recognise the giants upon whose shoulders one stands. And uh, you know, really, there was a handful of people in that era who documented um, what was going on at the very edge of. Of interesting music in the in the sixties in London, and uh, really this book, in a way, it's like it's like the usual camera angle on London in the sixties is, is pointed that way, 
But actually, if you just pan the camera around that way, there's all kinds of interesting stuff happening at the edges. And uh, very few people were documenting that stuff. Um, and sometimes they weren't. Sometimes, you know, it's up to me to, to find Trevor Watts or Hard Riley or Mick Eve or, or whoever, Brian Hogg or whoever from that era who was doing interesting music that never quite got recorded or uh, never quite made the headlines, but was really profoundly interesting. So it's, it's swinging London with the camera panning that way through the prism of John McLaughlin. He's the, he's the central character. <laughs> was that a metaphor too far? <laughs> well, uh, anyway, I, I, I feel that I'm rambling, uh, Lindley, so... Well, at this stage then, in that case, I will draw this part of the evening to the close, which is the part where we have had the chance to question the author on a book, which is substantially going to enhance the historical uh, pedagogue, I guess, of jazz history, the history of John McLaughlin, and the fact, the fact that that comes from someone who lives so close to us and is such a colleague and such a friend. It's a humbling experience. A round of applause, please, for this genius.